Hi guys, Alex here, and today we're going to be talking about the Deutz Gambit, which is a part of the Italian game. I should also mention before we begin that at some point we will analyze the Rosentrader variation of the Italian game because the Deutz Gambit can lead into the Rosentrader variation. And this is really important because it's a very dangerous weapon for white to surprise black with. And as we will soon see, many chess players get ensnared in the tricky positions of the Rosentrader and uh, typically it ends in disaster for black. So let's now move on to the chessboard and show the starting position. The moves are e4, e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, and bishop to c4, the Italian game. Bishop to c5 follows, and here, so far, we have spoken about moves like pawn to c3, the giocco piano, or pawn to b4. Now, we talk about white's option of castling. If, as the black player, you wish to avoid the complications of the Deutz Gambit, you can play the move pawn to d6. And with this move, white does not have the interesting idea that follows if black chooses knight f6 instead. After knight f6, the Deutz Gambit is now possible. d4. This is the beginning of the Deutz Gambit. If black captures e takes d4, we are now into the Max Lang attack, which is another popular opening, especially at the club level, but we will examine the theory of the Max Lang attack in the order of the two knights defense. So for now, we will not cover this as we will be covering it in a separate video. Instead, after d4, we will talk primarily about the option of bishop takes d4. This is the main response against the Deutz Gambit, and it is objectively the best move for black. The alternative that we should look at is knight takes d4. But we will not spend too much time on this move, because with this move, black is no longer defending the e5 pawn, and so white can capture it, and now he has had the gambited pawn returned to him immediately, and in fact, he stands a little bit better. So where we will be spending our time is with the challenging response of bishop takes d4. Now here, white must capture on d4 for the gambit to make sense. Let's actually step back and let's explain why d4 is an interesting option. The first reason is because e takes d4 takes us to max lang attack positions. So this is okay from a white perspective. The second reason is because if knight takes d4, white can recover his pawn immediately. While the main reason is because the only alternative move, bishop takes d4, forces black to part with his dark squared bishop and gives white the bishop pair. After knight takes d4, black has nothing better than to play knight takes d4. And another benefit of the Deutz Gambit is that this knight is no longer on f3. And so white can continue with the move pawn to f4. However, before we do this, let's talk about the option that might lead to the Rosen Trader variation of the Italian game. And that move is bishop to g5. This move, of course, makes a lot of sense, pinning the knight against the queen. Also, because black lost his dark square bishop, he has to be very careful along the dark squares, and this bishop can play a big role in causing black a headache. We can see this in the Rosen Trader, which follows after the move pawn to h6. White here will drop the bishop back to h4. After g5, black will allow the Rosen Trader variation. 
If you wish, you can pause the video and try and figure out what is the best move here for white. Okay, so I will now show the best move. The Rosen Trader involves an attack along the dark squares, which is not surprising because of this bishop on h4 being the only dark square bishop on the board, and it also involves taking advantage of the big lead in development and king safety that white has. White forgets about the bishop being attacked and plays the beautiful move pawn to f4. This move seems almost impossible to be played, and so it has caught out literally thousands of chess players on the black side. Already, the black position is very difficult here. Let's consider what are the options for black. Well, the most common response by the black player who finds himself in this position is g takes f4. However, now comes a second sacrifice, rook takes f4. The pressure on this knight is really great and black has to take the rook. But that leaves the knight undefended on d4, so after queen takes d4, white has lost the rook but has a knight in exchange. The problem for black is that this knight will also fall. He cannot move it because of the multiple pins and there is no way to defend it. Notice how black's position collapses along the dark squares. So, what else to do? E takes f4, of course, we can see is not a good idea since not only are rook takes f4 ideas available, but also the knight is immediately undefended. In the event of g takes h4, which perhaps is the best move, white can capture on e5 and create a double attack on both knights. Now, there is no way for black to avoid giving back his extra piece. His best move here is pawn to d5, but after pawn takes d5, knight takes d5, queen takes d4, black should continue with bishop e6, and he can more or less hold on and stay alive, but white's position remains better because his king is already castled and his future play is a little bit easier. There are more weak points in the black position. Nevertheless, this is the absolute best try for black. Pretty much all other options lose. Therefore, it probably comes as no surprise that in the original position of the Rosen trader, after black's dubious move pawn to g5, white should absolutely play f4. And from this position, no matter what black does, white will be at least a little bit better. And black has to be very, very careful to not be immediately lost. In fact, from this position at the club level, at the amateur level, white scores over 75% victories. So it's really a very powerful weapon to employ and uh, I'm sure that you will get very, very good results from the white side if you can arrive at this position. And on the other hand, from the black perspective, we should really be careful to know this theory and remember that the natural move pawn to g5 is not a good idea. Instead, after the move bishop to g5, black can indeed continue with pawn to h6, but after bishop h4, instead of pushing the pawn to g5, which allows the Rosen trader with f4, instead black should continue calmly with d6, supporting the center and activating the queen's bishop. Here, if white insists on continuing with f4, black has the strong move bishop to g4, after which he has no problems whatsoever. In fact, in a recent game between two young grandmasters, Niklas Huschenbeth from Germany and Benjamin Gildura from Hungary, the game continued bishop takes f6, and after bishop takes d1, black's position 
was already at least equal. Bishop takes d8, rook takes d8, rook takes d1, and now knight takes c2. Knight c3 would have been best, and after knight takes a1, rook takes a1, e takes f4, the dust has settled, and we can see that although white has two minor pieces for just a rook, and this is usually uh, very good for white, black has a lot of pawns in exchange. So overall, the position is somewhere between equal and a little bit better for black, in my opinion. And therefore, we can go back and we can see that the move bishop to g5 is only truly powerful if black pushes his g-pawn recklessly chasing after the uh, white bishop. It's a good practical try, but if black knows what he's doing, it's not going to trouble him. Therefore, the main line is instead f4. So we continue along with the Deutz gambit. Now, black should not take the pawn, of course, because that would leave the knight undefended, but instead support the pawn in the center with d6. Now, f takes e5, and d takes e5, and we see one of the benefits of playing the Deutz gambit. White has opened up the f-file and has pressure on the knight on f6, and also on the pawn on f7 indirectly. White follows up by increasing the pressure on the black uh, king's knight. And here, most club players play the move bishop to e6. While this is actually a perfectly good move, and it has even been played by some master level players, I really like and recommend the most popular master level move, and that is queen e7. The reason why this move is a little bit more precise, in my view, is that it leaves the e6 square available, which can often be used by the knight to jump back to e6 and challenge the bishop on g5. Additionally, the queen from e7 looks to perhaps take advantage at some point of the king, of the exposed white king, along the g1 to a7 diagonal that has been opened up ever since white lost his f-pawn. The bishop on c4 connects with the king if the queen can land on c5, and we can see this double attack would be devastating because of the fact that the bishop is undefended. So these are the reasons why I really like the move queen e7, both from a theoretical perspective in the sense that it's the best computer move, but also from a practical human perspective, in the sense that if white is not careful, queen c5 check at the right moment, or knight e6 at the right moment, can give white a lot of problems. For example, here, the main move that we're going to look at is knight to a3, which immediately defends the bishop. But let's imagine if white continues with c3. This is a very natural human move, striking at the knight on d4. But now, after knight to e6, bishop takes f6, black can capture the bishop, keeping his extra pawn, but having doubled pawns, this is nevertheless a good position for black, or black can play simpler chess with the move queen c5 check, and after king to h1, take the light squared bishop on c4. The bishop is attacked, and the knight on e6 does a great job of defending the g7 pawn and the d8 square. Without it, white would simply be checkmating. Instead, because of this, white has nothing better than to take the pawn on e5, and now black can continue by taking the pawn on e4. White would simply be much, much worse here if he didn't have a tactical trick he can play the move bishop takes c7. The point is that knight takes c7 would lead to the loss of the queen after the move rook to e1. Therefore, black should instead castle. 
and now white should save his bishop. Material in this position is level, but in fact, I prefer the black position because after white saves his bishop, black will at some point seek to place his light squared bishop on this long diagonal, and it is white's king with only two pawns as shelter that will actually be uh, a lot more vulnerable in this middle game. Therefore, black has the slightly better chances. Returning now to the position before c3, as we already mentioned, the move knight a3 is best for white. This defends the c4 bishop and avoids a lot of nasty tactics. Here, black has another very clever move. He can play the move rook to g8. This is really a high level move. It seems illogical to place your rook in front of your own pawn. Rooks belong on open files. But the key point is that black is anticipating that at some point white will want to capture on f6. And after g takes f6, the rook on g8 all of a sudden is perfectly poised to attack the white king. After rook g8, White's best bet is to step off the long g1 to a7 diagonal and go to h1. Black now leaves the e6 square available, perhaps for his knight to return to e6, and plays bishop d7. This is a useful move because it prepares to castle queenside and it also covers the b5 square, which is being eyed up by White's queenside minor pieces. White now would like to increase the pressure against f6, but the move queen f3 is not possible because the knight covers that square. Therefore, white maneuvers along the dark squares and plays the move queen to e1, preparing queen f2. Black should continue to castle, and here white plays queen f2, increasing the pressure on the knight. Black's best bet here is bishop to e6. Now, in this position, white typically continues with rook a to e1. A good question is why does white not capture here on f6 and win a pawn? Well, he can win his pawn back, but the problem is that after g takes f6, queen takes f6, suddenly white's queen side is in trouble after queen to b4 from black. And here it turns out that although white has recovered his pawn, the complications favor black. Black's pieces are more centrally placed, black's heavy pieces are more active, and black has more threats than white overall. Therefore, for tactical reasons, white should not recover his pawn so quickly. We now return to the original position, and we will show white's best move, which is rook a to e1, defending on e4. Now, black plays once again a very clever move. He plays the move pawn to a6. The point is that black is anticipating the move pawn to c3 by white coming soon, and in fact, that move occurs after bishop takes f6 and g takes f6, here, rather than capturing on f6, after which the same move as before, queen to b4, is a big problem for white, instead, white's best bet is pawn to c3, kicking out the knight. And now the move pawn a6 makes sense because not only was the pawn being x-rayed by the queen, but now the control of b5 can be used by black, planting the knight on b5. If knight takes b5, then black does not capture the knight, but instead he captures the bishop on c4, and he is winning because of the double attack on the rook and the knight. Therefore, white should capture bishop takes b5. After a takes b5, if white captures the pawn, it's the same again. Bishop to c4 will win material for black. Therefore, White's best bet is the scary-looking move, queen a7, trying to generate some play 
against the black king and threatening queen a8 or in some situations knight takes b5. However, black can react calmly. He plays the move c6, defending b5 and giving some more freedom to the black king. White should bring his knight into the game and black can now push his king forward and soon prepare to evict the white queen from a7. Note that the move queen a5 check will not lead to some kind of draw after queen king c8, queen a8, king c7 and queen a5 because black will drop the king back to b8 instead and there will be no more checks. Therefore, we leave our theoretical analysis of the Deutz gambit and the Rosentrader gambit in, uh, this as, with this as the final position, where we see that black is actually up a pawn, and really white's compensation is minimal if it even exists. While it may be true that black's structure on the king side is damaged, on the other hand, black's rooks are on uh, either semi-open files or open files and his minor piece, the bishop, is at least as good as white's minor piece, the knight. So I would certainly take the black pieces here and in fact it's because of this, because of all of this analysis, that I'm very happy when I see either the Deutz gambit or an attempt at entering the Rosentrader variation because if, white, if black doesn't know what he's doing, he can land himself into a lot of trouble fast. But if black knows what he's doing, then he will ultimately emerge with a better position. So my advice to you, if you are thinking of playing this from the white side, is play it against club level players and even strong amateurs, but avoid the Deutz gambit against the pros because they will know the theory and you will have a disadvantage with the white pieces very early on. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video of the Italian game series.